so today um, I'd like to talk uh, about something which I think uh, is really going to have a profound impact on the world uh, and probably as importantly what you guys are all about to you know, embark on and that's uh, this notion that we're entering what we would call uh, the beginnings of an internet of value. So obviously we've had an internet of data for the last 20 years. It's fundamentally changed our world, certainly changed everything that we've been a part of here. Um, I think uh, equally as exciting is what we're about to enter. This is in some ways, it's like we were talking earlier, this is like 1994 uh, in terms of the beginning of this new internet, but an internet for moving value, not just data. And they're two completely different things. And uh, so I'll spend some time talking about what that means. I'll show you a little bit um, about what we're working on specifically. And then I'd like to point out a couple of kind of fundamental things that are uh, kind of resulting from that. Uh, so, as mentioned, I've been involved over the last 20 years now in three fintech ventures, uh, beginning uh, with uh, eLoan back in the first dot-com uh, wave, then we also did Prosper uh, and Ripple. Uh, that's been, you know, a lot of uh, ups and downs along the way, but really a fascinating time. But I would say nothing compared to what we're journeying into now. All these fintech companies we've seen so far were built in sort of a pre-internet of value world. And now we're entering this sort of post-internet of value world. So I think what we're going to see is, you know, the same kind of Cambrian explosion of new businesses that popped up once the internet got going. I think that's exactly what we're going to see in fintech. So I think we, have, we, we haven't seen anything yet compared to, to what's coming. And, you know, obviously the first two companies we were involved with were consumer. You know, we were trying to uh, disrupt the banks. Uh, we're much more interested now in building that infrastructure that's going to enable this Internet of Value. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means uh, with Ripple. And sometimes it seems more boring, but I think it's going to be much more impactful, actually, given what we're about to enter. So this notion of an Internet of Value, I think there is a, there's a lot of parallels on how the Internet of Data uh, built out that we can learn from, and we're going to actually copy. Um, there's also some things that are fundamentally different uh, between an Internet of Value and an Internet of Data. And one of them uh, this is kind of a quote you guys may have seen from uh, our friend Mark Andreessen, uh, who is a wonderful guy. I love Mark uh, to death. But you may have seen this. Uh, he talks about, uh, hey, software is going to eat the world. And, and, you know, it's talked about like, gee, that must be a good thing. We're going to, you know, the world's going to be eaten. Uh, everybody's going to be disrupted. Awesome. Um, this is actually one of the things I think that really has to change when we're talking about an Internet of Value. Um, this, this sort of very chest-pounding um, sort of disruption is a great thing all the time. Um, this is sort of an occupational hazard of living out here. Sometimes I joke, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing you say when you're drunk and not wearing pants. But, you know, really, this is just not a constructive way of building companies. And I hope we can all kind of learn from that. And, and, and change up because, you know, when we talk about fintech, um, we need a big tent for fintech. Uh, you know, when you, when, you, when you look at what has to happen here, there are so many different uh, types of people, so many different domains that have to work together here or we're going to have no impact. Um, so, you know, the entrepreneurs need to work with the regulators, the consumer groups, and most importantly, we, we have to work with the banks, particularly in this, these early days of this Internet of Value. The banks are the networks of value on Earth today. There's just, uh, they're, it's equivalent to the way we all had to get, you know, libraries and universities and research institutes. You know, they were the custodians of data. We, we needed to connect them first before you could get a functioning internet. And that's kind of exactly what we need to do with this internet of value. We've got to get the existing networks of value, the owners of those networks, working together so we can build that foundation. So um, that needs more diplomacy than it does disruption. Um, if we're going to have impact, we all have to sort of work together. So we like to think of um, you know, businesses today, startup todays. Try to be, think of uh, uh, yourselves as builders, not disruptors. Um, and I think that's particularly important um, in the world that we're going into. So I, I think it's actually a bright future. That's why we show this. But, you know, the Internet of Value, I think, is more than just laying out kind of a, a new way of doing finance. I think fundamentally this represents the final step in globalization. And, you know, we're at a, we're at a very interesting time right now with globalization. The world has never been more interconnected, more dependent on each other. We have got to work together as uh, one world. 
Um, it's also never been sort of more divided, and there's never been more disillusionment around what globalization uh, means. And I think, I think that's fair. Uh, people should be disillusioned with globalization, but not because it's a, a bad idea. Um, it's more, um, it's a work in progress. It's incomplete. There is something missing with globalization. And we like to use the analogy of fire. You know, you cannot have fire uh, without fuel, oxygen, and heat. And I think the same thing applies with globalization. You, globalization does not work <clears throat> unless you have interoperability between three things, data, goods, and money. And the truth is we only have interoperability in two of those things. Goods and data are fully interoperable around the world. Money is not. Um, so in some ways, we sort of have a, a fire without uh, fuel. Uh, it's sort of the smoldering thing. We know there's potential there, but it, it really isn't delivering on all, all the promise. And probably, you'd, I think, safe to argue, it's actually making things quite a bit worse. A incomplete globalized system, kind of, you know, if you're in a developing uh, market, uh, maybe if you're in a, you know, kind of underserved market, you see all the data through your social media feeds, you, you have access to all this information and what other people are doing in their lives. But because the money part is not interoperable, you can't, you can't act on it. Uh, there's tons of parts of our planet where you can see, but you can't act. And that's a big problem. So um, you know, we, uh, we look kind of like, how do we get here? Look at all these components of globalization coming back. This is a pretty recent thing. Um, if you look at uh, goods, for example, you look at shipping, uh, and we're just, just going back to the 50s, before the shipping container, so about pre-container. Um, you know, the 50s weren't that long ago, but from my perspective. I know it seems like prehistoric times for you guys, but, um, you know, things have moved very rapidly. Um, if you look at shipping before the shipping container, shipping was an incredibly inefficient uh, activity. It was extremely labor-intensive. Uh, you know, goods would show up in a port, uh, they'd have to be unpacked, they had to be repacked. This was an incredible sort of friction point or burden on global trade. And then along comes a very, very simple innovation, a very simple technology, nothing uh, super complicated, very, very basic low level called the shipping container in, in about the 50s. And that fundamentally changed the way uh, goods and, and, and shipping uh, worked. In the next 20 years, you had about a 700% increase uh, in, in global trade. And that, why is that? It's because now goods were completely interoperable around the world. You could go from ship to train the truck without having to touch anything. Every port in the world uh, was interoperable. You didn't need bilateral agreements to, make, to ship goods. Um, shipping companies were interoperable. So I get to fundamentally change the way goods worked. Goods are now globalized. We all know what happened with data. You know, before the World Wide Web, it was incredibly expensive to communicate or send data cross-network. Uh, so that was a huge uh, point of friction on how the world communicated. Obviously, with the World Wide Web now, three billion people can communicate without being on the same network. That's the, really the key point there. Uh, we have a network of networks when it comes to data and communications. Fundamentally changed the way communications work. But that's not the case with money. Money is sort of that missing ingredient. Uh, with money today, the world spends about $2 trillion a year just to move value between networks or cross-border. Uh, and even spending that much money, um, we have uh, missing ac you know, access is blocked to billions of people. Uh, and you have incredible fail rates. So single-digit failure rates on cross-border value transfer, single-digit. Um, you know, in tech world, you talk about five, nine reliabilities. That's expected. When it comes to cross-border transfers of value, you're talking one nine. So that is incredibly expensive for the world. This is a huge burden. And again, that's why globalization is probably not working for most people. Um, and it's why, you know, if you, if you look at how this is all working today, even a wealthy European can't send, you know, even 50 euros cross-border without it all being chewed up in fees, let alone the uh, people in developing uh, markets that, according to the Gates Foundation, you know, they need to be able to send 50 cents cross-border if they're really going to be full economic citizens. That's impacting about 2 billion people in the world. Let alone uh, this sort of emerging uh, Internet of Things, where you know, what we're going to be seeing is, by 2020, 50 billion 
devices that are not just going to be exchanging data, but are actually going to be exchanging uh, value, just like all your devices sitting here right now are exchanging data uh, you know, as we sit here. That's what we should expect uh, with machine-to-machine uh, -machine payments. So I would argue machine-to-machine -machine payments will actually dominate uh, value transfer on Earth if we get the right infrastructure. Um, but that can't happen today, right? We need, this needs uh, the ability to send a hundredth of a penny, a thousandth of a euro, and you just can't do that cross-border in today's world. Okay, but there is light at, on the horizon here. Um, we have new technologies that uh, are showing great promise, and obviously one of the big themes, and I know you guys talk about this a lot, and this is in the press every single day, and it's, I don't know if it's the most overhyped uh, category of technology, but it's probably a contender, um, blockchain technologies. You know, obviously a fascinating technology. It is uh, ingenious. It's a game changer for sure. Um, you know, and, and what is it? It's a novel way of recording transactions that makes them immutable. Uh, these are basically distributed uh, or decentralized databases where multiple copies of that database are kept all over the world. No one party that uses the database can change the database unless you have consensus with all the other people that are, that are using it. Definitely very novel, very interesting, will have some applications. However, at the end of the day, a blockchain is nothing more than another network. So it does not solve this problem of interoperability or this need to have a network of networks for value. In fact, it's just adding to the burden of that need, right? These are just additional networks. They'll need to be interoperable. Bitcoin will need to be interoperable with Venmo or with HS HSBC's core ledgers. That problem cannot be solved by blockchains. And we think this is the critical need uh, in, in FinTech because, again, this will set uh, a new platform for this, you know, again, Cambrian explosion of new, of new startups. So while blockchain is not the answer, uh, we do think it has set off kind of an unstoppable movement. It's attracted so much attention, brain power, and capital. And now you're seeing kind of second generation applications of not just blockchain, but I think more broadly what you'd call uh, distributed financial technologies. One of the ones we're most excited about that we do think can solve this interoperability problem or become the sort of network of networks is something called the Interledger Protocol or ILP. And we think that can solve that problem of how do you enable sort of a network of networks to allow value to be instantly transferred between a, uh, two networks or multiple hop networks, uh, just the way the internet has fundamentally changed data. And I'll talk about this a little bit uh, further, uh, but we think this is really the game changer that brings us to that sort of idea of a grand network of networks where you have goods, data, and money all interoperable globally. And I think now we're off to the races on making globalization uh, work and including those two billion people that uh, you know, are now kind of off the grid they now become full economic actors um, or full uh, citizens uh, in the global economy and that those uh, devices actually become full economic actors as well. So you now can have uh, devices that are buying, selling, paying taxes. Um, I mean, this will have all kinds of implications. You could argue that Japan will be the most populous country on earth in terms of economic actors since they probably are building most of the devices and robots that will actually be exchanging value, that really changes the game uh, on how the world's going to work. So again, uh, we think uh, this is all about then head down, let's, let's start building, let's kind of knock off all the disruption talk that is really ho actually holding things back. I would argue that some of the early Bitcoin discussions around, uh, hey, we're going to kill the banks and you know, we're going to take everything over, have been a major setback in, in this sort of fintech. Uh, wave, and we need to get off this kind of adolescent, uh, chest-pounding, arrogant, Trump-like attitude about how innovation works. So we got to get down the building. Uh, with that, then, let me um, show you a little bit about what we're building at Ripple. This is about a two-and-a-half-minute uh, video with audio uh, that kind of explains uh, what we're trying to do. Uh, I should point out, though, that, again, this is aimed at banks. Again, we think... Uh, creating interoperability between banks is the key step 
in how we create this internet of value. Again, we were talking earlier, this is like 1994 all over again, and we're really just laying the infrastructure. So we've got to get the banks on board. This is uh, to a bank audience, so there'll be some weird terminology in here. And it's also specifically cross-border or cross-network. Cross-border, cross-network, really kind of the same ideas. Um, so here we go, and then I'll, I'll go from here. Hopefully this will work. Yeah. How Ripple works. Let's look at the inner workings of Ripple's solution and how it improves cross-border payments. In this example, two banks use a correspondent bank to route their payments. The Ripple solution includes Ripple Connect, which is used to coordinate information exchange between the banks. And the ILP Ledger uses the Interledger protocol to coordinate funds movement between institutions to settle the payment. The solution ingests existing message formats like Swift Fin or ISO 20022 through a translation layer such as CGI's Intelligent Gateway or Volante's Volpay. Let's follow one payment through the entire payment flow. First, the translation layer parses the message and collects necessary information to initiate the payment. Here you see that Alice in the US wants to send money to Bob in Germany. She wants Bob to receive 500 euros. Ripple Connect communicates with the correspondent and beneficiary banks to obtain their payment processing fees and total cost. Next, pre-transaction validation takes place. This includes compliance screening and account verification checks. Since all banks have the necessary facts, they can pre-validate the payment even before funds move to ensure high straight-through processing rates. Now it's time to coordinate funds flow across the private ILP ledgers of these three different institutions. In this example, the originating bank has a Nostro account with the correspondent bank, and the beneficiary bank is using a third-party liquidity provider to connect in with the correspondent bank. To begin the settlement process, Ripple coordinates a hold on the funds across all three ledgers. The ILP ledgers generate cryptographic signatures to verify that the funds are committed to the transaction. Then, the funds are simultaneously released across the three ledgers. This process ensures no settlement risk. The payment either executes or fails. Upon completion, Ripple provides a confirmation message to all counterparties. The entire payment process across multiple banks takes seconds and provides end-to-end -end visibility into the transaction while increasing processing rates and lowering operational costs. Join the global real-time settlement network today at ripple.com slash contact. Okay, so obviously there's a lot of very specific bank-like, you know, language there, but this is aimed specifically at sort of the transaction banking parts of banks, the, the part of the bank that would be involved in, in cross-border uh, payment and settlement. I would argue, again, that's the, the biggest pain point, a huge problem, uh, you know, multiple billions of dollars that are spent uh, that needs to be solved, and we think, we think again, quote unquote, blockchain technology will have the biggest impact initially. Initially, um, let me kind of distill down a couple of points here, though, that I think are most important. So, what's really going on there? Um, one of the big changes that's going to occur with this Internet of Value is that value transfer across networks is going to move from being a sequential process, like it is today, and which is a huge problem, to becoming more of a coordinated, synchronized process. So a sequential process is just that. You know, we've probably all seen this when you're trying to send money overseas from your bank. You know it's left your bank account, but you're calling your recipient, and it's like days go by, and they don't have it. Like, where is it? Well, your bank probably doesn't even know because it's, it's gone from their ledger or their network to some intermediate ledger to some other intermediate ledger that they may not even know about. And this could be literally, you know, four or five hops. Um, and so why, what's, why is that a problem? Uh, obviously, that's a huge time delay. Mo you know, time is money. More importantly, though, that is settlement risk. Um, so there are too many states that can happen there. It could either go, it could not go, or it could be somewhere stuck in the middle. That is a huge, huge problem. So uh, that settlement risk is really what drives up costs, and then that makes small payments that you might need from the underbanked or from devices or just from you know, everybody uh, unprofitable and not possible. Um, it, what we change then is we turn that into a coordinated, synchronized approach so that no matter how many hops are involved, no matter how many nodes have to be hit, they're all uh, cryptographically being verified at the same time. So there is no settlement risk. There's only two states that can happen in that kind of a model. 
It's called an atomic transaction. It either goes or it doesn't go. Atomic is kind of the key word there, and that's sort of the way the internet works, if, if you will. Uh, the other kind of big thing that's changing, of course, is that we're modeling this after the architecture of the internet. And you think about what, what does the internet really mean? It's, you know, internetworking. Um, that just simply means you have the ability for networks to uh, communicate with each other. Um, so, you know, kind of a network of networks. Uh, and that's a very different model than what you have uh, today. If you look at the way the internet architecture works, at the bottom you have, you know, whatever network it is, you know, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, whatever. And at the top you have whatever application is trying to be used, right? So the key thing is any application can be used on any network. How does that happen? It's because in the middle you've got, uh, you know, obviously IP and you have some transfer layers, but, you know, most importantly you have this internet protocol which, which allows that. Um, and that's what you're doing now to money. So when we talk about ledgers, ledgers are really just value networks, right? So the idea here is whatever the ledger is, and here I just have three examples of distributed ledgers, but that could certainly be HSBC's ledger, Citibank's ledger, Venmo's ledger, everybody, you know, any payment company has a ledger that holds state, and then of course any application should be able to run on any, any uh, network. That's not the way it works today. Every application needs to be built on every single network uh, independently and differently. And that's, the, that's a huge problem. So ILP, the Interledger Protocol, is analogous to IP Internet Protocol. Um, and again, what you're, what you're really trying to do is, you know, if I want to send you an email, I don't have to ask you, well, are you on Verizon or, you know, are you on AT&T or, you know, what, what's, who's your provider? I just need your address and I can send it anywhere in the world. Um, that's not the way it works with money. If you say, hey, send me 10 bucks, well, are you on Venmo, or are you on PayPal, or who, you know, on Visa? So that's what you're trying to solve fundamentally. Uh, and again, uh, you know, Venmo does not interoperate, it's great, but it doesn't interoperate with other networks like uh, TenPay, for example. So this is the problem we're really trying to solve, and this is really fundamentally what changes. And what's interesting here is I think the, the way companies compete is gonna fundamentally change like it did with the internet. If you uh, look at payment companies today, what do they advertise? They advertise, advertise reach. So Visa, they're everywhere you want to be. Well, actually, they're only in, cover about 15% of the world, right? It's not everywhere. Um, but that's what everybody's competing on. And that is, uh, used to be the way information networks worked as well. If you look at some of the old advertisements, nobody in this room remembers this company, right? Um, you know, uh, CompuServe, uh, what did they use to advertise? We've got you know, the most members, we're the biggest, we have the most services. Uh, and obviously in the internet uh, changed all that, right? The internet commoditized reach. So now whether you're a big company or a small company, everybody has the same reach. So that means you compete on other things. If you look at the communication companies today, they don't mention reach. Uh, what they mention is speed or service or most importantly, you know, price, ease, ease of use. This is super, super important when it comes to serving the underbanked, for example. Um, in many countries around the world, you might have a single payment provider. They're the only ones with reach in that market. And because of that, they can be sloppy on everything else. So they can be super expensive, terrible service, and this is really holding you know, back the world. Once uh, reach is commoditized through, of course, IP and, and data and ILP and value, now, Whatever market in the world now has the entire uh, world's companies competing because everybody has the same reach. That's a big deal. Um, and of course, uh, talk about Venmo, TenPay. Of course, Venmo and TenPay can make a deal with each other. And they can say, well, we're inter interoperable because we have a bilateral agreement. Um, but here's the problem with bilateral agreements. I mean, certainly you can do that. Um, but bilateral agreements don't scale, right? If everybody has to get a bilateral agreement with everybody else, it's a mess. It just doesn't work. And the beauty of an internet type architecture is that scales. So networks of networks scale, and it means that one network does not have to have a connection to another network in order to send value. No more than you know, a port in Rotterdam has to have a bilateral agreement with you know, a Walmart in Denver to send goods. It just shows up as the same shipping container. Right? So shipping containers created interoperability. The internet created interoperability of data. And that's what's happening here. So that uh, we can now take multiple hops uh, and you can get value 
between any networks without bilateral agreements. This is, by the way, why bilateral agreements in trade are not as good as trade agreements, right? So we're going backwards in some ways, but we've got to move forward in others. So, um, but this is very important. And by the way, that first thing we mentioned about the process going from sequential to coordinated, you can't do multiple hops in a sequential system. So all these things are very necessary if we're going to get an internet of value. Okay, and then what does that mean at the end of the day? That means the fixed costs of value transfer go down to zero. This is what happened with data, uh, and that created the fundamental change. Once that happens, now that hundredth of a penny device transaction is profitable to a bank or maybe to a new fintech startup. And what do you get? You get the same Cambrian explosion of new startups that you saw with uh, the internet. I think that is exactly what's going to happen in the fintech world once you get this structure in place, and that is happening right now. So a very exciting time. Um, it's really encouraging to see so many people involved in fintech here. You guys can have a huge impact on how this plays out, and I think your, your timing is great. So uh, that's all I had as uh, far as what I wanted to talk about. I'm, of course, happy to open up for any questions anybody might have. Well, thank you for that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And as usual, please use the microphone if you have a question. I know there are plenty of questions in the room, so, so go for it. Please, here. Uh, so my question is, uh, what are some of the regulatory hurdles to achieving an interoperable network across borders? And how, how have you overcome that so far? And how do you continue planning to overcome that? Yeah, so uh, great question. And so, uh, you know, again, the Internet of Value is going to be so different from the first Internet because you're going to have three uh, really different domains have to work, work together, right? Tech, capital, and compliance. And compliance just has a, an outsized, uh, you know, influence when it comes to money for obvious reasons. It's not going to change. It's just the reality. We sort of need to sort of stop fighting that and just say that's just the way it is. But I think there's a lot of good news there. Throughout the world, fintech generally and blockchain specifically has become, you know, kind of very, very popular in, in the, you know, with policymakers. So we have a stream of policymakers coming from all over the world, coming through our offices. Uh, so that's a very good dynamic that's very different from two years ago. Uh, two years ago with the Mt. Gox collapse. Uh, and some of the nonsense being spewed out by sort of these, you know, libertarian Bitcoin fanatics, which was just not helpful at all. Uh, and thankfully, they've really come, uh, Bitcoin community has done a great job of really adjusting. They've got lobbyists all over the world. They're well-funded, much better. Um, but, you know, you, you have to take it seriously. You've got to get good compliance people involved in your startups really early. I know it's a pain, it's expensive, but you just got to do it. Um, I'd say get some connections to policymakers. Don't spend too much time in Washington. It can be a real sinkhole. So you can get in that trap as well where you're you know, having a lot of meetings and meanwhile your competitors are getting ahead of you because you're spending too much time in Washington uh, or Luxembourg or Singapore or Tokyo. Those are kind of the big FinTech centers that are developing. Um, you know, there's a couple of things we would say have to happen. One, uh, it would be nice if uh, the administration, whatever administration, uh, puts fintech on their top 15 things to think about. We didn't have that in the Obama administration, unfortunately. Hopefully we'll get that in the new administration. Uh, and what would be helpful is to get a sort of a Clinton-like uh, framework that we had in 97. That was kind of a turning point in the internet. Uh, President Clinton signed a, uh, something called the Global Framework for E-Commerce. And I think that was the turning point from the internet looking like a sketchy, scary, bad thing to, uh, no, that's a good thing. It just set a framework that all the other regulators could follow. There was another one like that in Bonn, Germany, that was also helpful in, in Europe. Um, we need that. Uh, there would be an argument also, not to get too much in the weeds, but when you go node to node, you know, if you're sending packets of information through a router that's not a recipient or a sender, you don't have any problems with copyright law. Um, it would be nice, I don't think you have a problem really with value, but it would be nice if you had some rulings that made that ironclad. So that, you know, you're not a money transmitter if you're just a node and a multi-hop network of networks. That would be nice to have. Yeah, please, you can just approach the microphone for those who have questions. Yeah. Thanks. It's really been awesome seeing your vision. Uh, I have a, actually a couple of questions. The first one is probably, so, 
If I have you correct, ILP is to payments what IP is to the internet. And um, how do you actually plan to get all the different players in the network to adopt that protocol? Because you end up getting to a point where you have fiber running, you know, between let's say countries, but the banks are still running on copper cables. So how do you actually get them to like buy into that and actually change their networks, which are giving them a lot of revenue at this point in time? So they're making a lot of money off it. What what incentivizes them to change? Uh, yeah. So uh, so the, uh, two questions there. I guess there's a number of things you can do as far as standard setting. So ILP is not something that we own, right? We've definitely contributed a ton to it, and some of our early team members actually came up with that. But it sits uh, as a nonprofit, uh, permissible license, you know, entity in Luxembourg. Luxembourg picked on purpose because that's the seems to be the best jurisdiction for the Chinese, the Germans, and the Americans. Um, and then there's kind of the key players, I think, in value transfer. Uh, you know, again, not to I'll leave anybody off that list, but you know, those would be the problem areas if somebody was unhappy. Uh, so that's important. Then working with the W3C, some of the standard setting bodies. There's a IOP working group has about 200 members, including a lot of big tech companies. So it feels like it's in a pretty good place. We're making you know, a lot of good progress is being made there on adoption. Um, but as far as what is the bank's motivation, um, I think the banks have understood that <clears throat> cross-border payments are a broken. It's a broken system today. And if you look at so you know, uh, global commerce is increasing obviously like this. Correspondent banking, which is the way the old system, you know, SWIFT and correspondent banking is the way that the system works today. It's actually decreasing. So banks are pulling back from particularly exotic corridors where there's too much regulatory burden. ILP solves all that, right? Um, so because you don't have to have a presence in each market. Again, reach is commoditized, right? So I think banks have understood that uh, it's a broken system, needs to be fixed. And if they don't fix it, you know, right now I'd say banks are well positioned. But the big eight are going to eat, eat their lunch. You know, the big eight being you know, Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent, Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook. They are getting in the payments. And um, it, will, it will take them a while because they're not regulated entities, but you can't stop that. So, I, but I think the banks understand that. And there's a lot of movement going on right now in, in 17 and, and, and getting into next year as well. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Just worried about uh, security. How do you stop the crooks from uh, sending messages on the ILP like they recently did on Swift, right? How do we deal with that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so Swift, I think, has some fundamental problems. And then the, I don't know, everybody knows what Swift is, but it's sort of the, it's the, uh, uh, it's a bank-owned entity, and it is sort of the way that. Uh, banks message each, each other with payments. The really important thing about SWIFT is though it's, again, it's only the messaging layer. It's not the actual settlement layer. That's one problem. So it's kind of a decoupled process, which is a problem. The other problem is it's a closed network. So, um, you know, nobody, nobody knows how it, you know, we can see how it works, right? So we would argue that open source systems like ILP and, and like most of blockchain is open source are going to be more durable systems. Because they're open source, they're being attacked all the time. Uh, Bitcoin's being attacked all the time. Bitcoin has not broken yet. Um, XRP or Ripple's consensus ledger is not broken. Um, so they're being attacked all the time. I think that's a, that's a good thing. Um, the thing about ILP that's important is it's more an analogous to that shipping container. right? So if you're a sender and a receiver, um, your shipping container has nothing to do with somebody else's shipping container. That's really important, right? If you're on a network or a ledger, uh, anybody who goes on that ledger affects everybody else who's on that ledger because it's a network. Um, IOP does not hold state, right? So it's not a database, doesn't hold state. It's only relevant to the sender and the receiver who now form uh, a, almost like a temporary blockchain. Um, so that's private to those two parties. So it's not sort of out in the wilderness, if you will. Does that make sense? Because each ledger who's receiving it is still doing all their usual checks. If you're a weak network who's ILP enabled, you're still weak. If you're a strong network, you're fine. So all you're really trying to do there is allow those networks to exchange value. So it's not going to solve the security problems, it's just not going to make them worse? Well, it solves the, the problem on uh, SWIFT being a closed system, right? This is an open system. And uh, there's obviously scalability issues that 
could get bad. You know, an ILP has uh, infinite scalability. Again, it's more analogous to a shipping container. One shipping container has nothing to do with another shipping container. I, I know this gets really weird really quickly. There's a bunch of white papers, by the way, on uh, ILP uh, interledger.org, by the way, that are, might be helpful there. <laughs> I'll ask one if I, if I may. I've got a microphone. You'll have to use that one. Um, the, the institutions like the Bank for International Settlements, right, they spend a lot of time thinking about settlement risk and trying to contain it. Could institutions like that be helpful to you in, in helping adoption happen faster? BIS could be. We've met with them. Um, I, they see more of a policy arm. So as far as standard settings, yes. Um, so definitely we are uh, cognizant that, you know, central banks will play a role. Uh, you're seeing a lot of really cool things coming out of the Bank of England. Uh, the, the Bank of Japan now has gotten very, I think, actually, frankly, I think Japan is really leaping ahead as far as innovation in this category. Um, Fed has actually been pretty constructive. They have a lot of people working on, you know, where these technologies mean. So there's a lot of these international bodies and central banks that are part of the mix, which I think just from a credibility standpoint, you know, it kind of gives it a little bit of a seal of approval. It's not, it's not like the reg, you know, you have separate regulators, enforcement people, but it helps. It helps get the banks comfortable and then and the tech companies comfortable. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay, cool. Great. Well, Chris, you know, so many of the things, we, we got to talk to Chris a little bit in advance and then some of the things that he said here, but just a, a lot of things that will stick with me. We were talking earlier about blockchain and how sometimes we get enthralled with technology. Often we get enthralled with technology. And part of his advice was know what problem you're solving, right? And this notion of what problem we're trying to solve, that interledger protocol and so forth, it helps to bring clarity to all of us, I think. That was just a super helpful piece of advice. And then the other thing, you know, we have a lot of people working here, as some of you know, on, on so-called multi-sector leadership. This idea that we don't, one doesn't just lead in the public or the civic sector or, or in, the, in the private sector. That in fact having some sense for the interconnectedness of those sectors, right? And that's obviously fundamental to what, what you're doing here. I mean, the connectivity to what you're doing here, to so much of what's going on at the school is absolutely outstanding. Chris, uh, you've taught us a lot. We thank you very, very much. Great. Thank you so much.